Our reading today comes from Psalms 84. Psalms 84. The word of the Lord says that how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And that is the word of the Lord. I'd like to pray a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. And, uh, and Paul would say, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God, is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And truly, Lord, that, that's the prayer of our heart that we who have been called to be your children may be ever growing in our knowledge of you and ever dwelling in that love you share. So, Lord, as we listen to your wonderful words, may you open the eyes of our hearts that we may behold wondrous things from your word. But, oh, Lord, may you change us, renew us, rebuke us, and transform us that we may be holy as you are holy. So this is your word. May you use it to change us. We are your people. May you speak to our hearts. And I am your servant. Use me. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And I would like to begin with a question for us today. Most of us have entered the new year with uh, resolutions. One of my resolutions for the year is to keep fit. Uh, I promised myself that I will start running or continue running. Uh, I haven't run in seven days, but January is still on, so I'm still uh, hoping to run again. But a question I'd like to ask us is, what is your deepest longing? That question is very private, so I won't ask you to ask your neighbor, but I'd like to ask you, what is your deepest longing? At the core of who you are, what is that one thing you'd give everything for? For some of us, I'd assume it would be good health. 2023 was a difficult year in relation to our health and we're trusting that this year we may be healthier. Perhaps we've uh, signed up for a gym membership somewhere. Perhaps we are thinking of changing our diet or perhaps we just desire that we'll be more healthier this year. For some of us, it may be a renewed relationship with your spouse. 
2023 was a difficult year in, in your marriage or in your relationships with one another and you're trusting the Lord or you're working very hard that this year may be a year of change. For others, 2023 was difficult for our pockets. And we're hoping that maybe we can get a good job. Maybe we'll get a promotion this year. And these desires, these longings drive us. They govern our lives. They have made us who we are or who we want to be. And it is evident in the resolutions we've written for this year. True? Be it to exercise more, be it to get money, be it for the young people to have uh, that thing for, for money that you guys keep, an emergency fund. Uh, there's a lot that we've planned and scheduled for this year that is related to our desires. And in similar fashion, the psalmist in Psalm chapter 84 writes down his inmost desire as Pastor Justice has read for us. He puts to words what he has truly longed for, what he yearns for, and that is to be found in the house of the Lord, to be constantly by his side, to desire to seek the Lord. And my assumption would be that that is the ultimate desire for all believers, that our preeminent pursuit is to be with the Lord, to be where the Lord is found, to be always at his feet, to be like Mary while her sister is worried about the things of the world. We just lay at the feet of Jesus, just listening to his sweet words and only caring for what he speaks of us. But sadly, most of us, including myself, are like Martha. We are worried about when we'll pay rent. We are worried about school fees. We are worried about our health. And sometimes even this God that is wonderful, even this God that has saved us, saved us seems like a distraction to our lives. Seems like a bother. Praying for a few minutes seems like it will mess up our whole schedule. So we'd rather give him like one minute of our prayer life. Reading the word has become difficult because the Lord is not our ultimate desire. He's not the one we long for. And so my desire for today, for you and for I, is to convince us that this God is worthy of all your pursuits. This God is worthy of all your devotion. This God is worthy of all your resources. And in that, may you reevaluate those resolutions, reevaluate your prayers for this year, that at the top of your prayer list may be that at the end of this year, as you look back, even if all other things never come to pass, you'll trust that throughout this year, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And in that we'll reflect on four points for today. If you have a pen uh, and a place to write or on your phone, these are the four points for today. The first point is the beauty of the house. The beauty of the house. That's from verse 1 to verse 3. The second point is the blessing in the house. The blessing in the house verse 4 and verse 7. The third point is the believer's prayer, verse 8 to 9, the believer's prayer. And the last point is a blessed assurance, verse 10 to 12. The beauty of the house, the blessing in the house, the believer's prayer, and a blessed assurance. Verse 1 begins by saying, how lovely is your dwelling place. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. The psalmist begins by expressing his longing for the tents, for the dwelling place of the Lord. He seems to be speaking of a majesty and a beauty of where God stays. He speaks as though he has examined the very courts of the Lord. He's been present where the Lord is and comes to the conclusion that this dwelling place, it is a beautiful place. 
this particular psalm, uh, if in your Bible it's written, is attributed to the sons of Korah. And these were people from the tribe of Benjamin. Thus he had the very privilege of being in the temple, watching the tabernacle. So as he speaks of these things, he speaks of someone with ultimate knowledge and comes to the very conclusion that it is a wonderful place. It is a beautiful thing. It is a sight to behold. He uses a very interesting phrase that is typical of the authors of the Psalms. He says, how lovely. It's as if he's unable to give full descriptive information and is asking us as the readers and the listeners, come and see for yourself. Come and experience beauty for yourself. I don't know if you've ever experienced something that was too grand for you to even say. That if you would tell someone, you'd either, they'd either not believe you or you'd, you wouldn't have the words enough to explain how beautiful, how majestic that thing was. And similar to the psalmist, as he observes the temp temple, as he observes the very presence of the Lord, he comes to the conclusion that it's a beautiful and marvelous place and you need to see it by yourself. It's as though he's reading from the same script as the author of Psalm 27 from verse 4 who says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to do what? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. An amazement of the beauty of the Lord. It's like you saw a shoe by the store and you said, I need to have this because it's beautiful or a dress on the store that is very beautiful that you couldn't express in words. And he goes to express a longing and fainting for this courts. The feeling itself of just imagining being in the presence of the Lord would cause an inexpressible desire to be there with the Lord. And the desire was deep enough that it resulted into a burst of singing and praising the Lord. He says, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. He seems to insinuate that the result of being with the Lord, that the result of just gazing at the beauty of the Lord should spy in us a joy that is inexpressible and a praise that is uncontainable. And I wonder, church, if that's your desire today. To see how beautiful, how majestic this God is. Is that part of your plans for this year? And he goes again from verse 3 and, and makes an observation of the birds of the air. He speaks of how they've found a home at the very feet of the Lord that they can raise their young, they can find rest. He's saying that all creation finds its home at the feet of the Lord. All that has come to being can call where the Lord is home. And the question I pose to us is how much more we? If at the feet of the Lord, the birds of the air, the swallow and the sparrow can find rest and shelter, how much more we, as Jesus would question, aren't you more valuable than the birds? We walk around with worries and anxieties, but the psalmist is just telling us if we keep our focus on the Lord, we shall find our rest because we are more valuable than the birds of the sky. A particular quote I came across uh, that reads, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so, said the sparrow to the robin. Friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. If we read this particular psalm and read the observation the psalmist is making, we should come to the conclusion that if the words know that their heavenly father care for them, how much more you? Aren't you more valuable than the birds? I believe one thing that keeps us from drawing closer to the Lord is we seem to have come to believe that he is not precious, he is not beautiful, he is not marvelous. But the psalmist believes differently that this God is lovely, where he is, is wonderful and that's where he should be found. And my desire for us is that this year, if we are to be found anywhere, is where the Lord is. If we are to be found pursuing anything, may our pursuits be the things of the Lord. Because he is great and grand in beauty, but more than that, he offers amazing shelter and rest. 
But secondly, on our second point, the blessings that are in the house. I think another thing that may hinder us from pursuing the Lord with much vigor is because in a way we've come to assume that there are no benefits, there are no blessings in following the Lord. Um, an interesting thing, this year marks 10 years ever since I became a Christian. Um, and I love, love that because I've seen sustenance, but I've seen the blessings of the Lord. But one of the reasons I, I was battling with that for very many years is because I believed falsely that when I got saved, my life would become boring, as some of my friends up there would say, or, or my la life would lack the good things that all other people would uh, have. I told myself that after I've enjoyed life, when I reach 40, that's when I'll get saved. We thank the Lord that I didn't reach 40 to get saved. But that's the weird assumption that we have is that if we go uh, and follow the Lord, if we trust the Lord we, with all we have, there are no benefits. Maybe the resolutions we have benefit you in one way or the other. If you get a good job, you get more money. If you're healthier, you're able to live longer. If you get a spouse, I believe you would be more happier. Yes? Uh, but we, are, we believe that in the Lord there's, there's nothing to be found. There's no benefit to be found. And that's why our devotion is low. We are satisfied by small and passive scripture reading. We might just wake up and read a line and go home and think we are satisfied enough. We, are, we care not to pray enough. A few minutes in prayer is okay for us. And our giving is low because what is the benefit the Lord would give us? But the psalm seems to look at it differently. He believes there is benefit and proper blessings to be found in the Lord and in the dwelling place of the Lord. And two things I see that he regards as blessing. Verse 4, joy. And verse 5 and 7, renewed strength. Joy, in verse 4 he says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. In the pursuit of of God, there is everlasting joy. David in Psalm 16 would say that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. The blessing is to be found by those in the presence of God, is that their mouths will be ever singing praises. I believe that the only time you sing praises is if there is joy in your heart. And this is the, the portion of those who are in the presence of the Lord, that they will be given joy so that their mouths, their mouths will just be seeing joy. In comparison to all we seem to seek, only God promises us joy in his presence. Let me tell you that this year, maybe you will never get that job. This year, maybe you will fall ill again. This year, maybe your loved one will die, and that will hurt so much. But the Lord promises us that in him, we can find true and sustained joy. Even when that job comes or not, even when that loved one dies or not, even when you're ill again or not, that only in him can we find sustained joy. Only in him can we gather with brothers and sisters and sing again the praises of the Lord. But the second one is renewed strength from verse 5 to 7. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the ways to Zion. As they grow through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of spring. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength and each one appears before God. Isaiah 40 verse 30 would say, even youths grow tired and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Again, everything you will pursue this year will take away your strength. If you run, you'll fall tired. Everything you seem to pursue will need you to have new strength to pursue it again because they don't give you the strength you need. But the Lord is promising us the only thing that we can pursue and renew our strength is our pursuit of the Lord, our pursuit to be with him, that they who wait on the Lord will do what will renew their strength. He says that those who trust in the Lord, they will be moving from strength to strength. And I wonder, isn't that a pursuit you would want to have? 
A pursuit that gives you strength. A pursuit that helps you to grow more and more daily. I believe that if we pursue the Lord, there is no stagnation. That if we are consistently reading the scripture, we grow in it. We grow in our trust in the Lord. We grow in our application of the word of the Lord in our day-to-day lives. If we are praying consistently, our faith grows and we trust the Lord for greater and greater things. It is not in vain. Your prayer life is not in vain. Your reading of scripture is not in vain. Your fellowship with fellow believers is not in vain. Abandoning your sins to walk with the Lord is not in vain. Because he will give you strength. He will renew your strength. But more than the strengthening, he says that each one will appear before God in Zion. That at the end of the day, our pursuits will reach their goal. That they who pursue the Lord, they who desire to dwell with the Lord, they will get to the end. They will receive the answer to their prayer and will appear before God. It's similar to what uh, Jesus would say in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, that blessed are they who hunger and thirst and righteousness because they will be filled that they will be satisfied. That if your desire is for the Lord, you will be filled. You will be satisfied. You will appear before God. And the statement in Matthew 6.33 will make great sense when it says, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all this will add it unto you. We will gain joy from seeking the Lord. We will gain sustained strength from seeking the Lord, even to continue pursuing the very things he's placed in your heart. And again, I tell us, church, he's worth your time. He's worth your resources. So won't you seek him today? But to our third point, it's the the believer's prayer. The psalmist pens down his prayer, and the prayer itself is that he longs to be at the very courts of the Lord. But interestingly, if you read verse 8 to 9, he cries out and makes it known that this is a prayer. He says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. This, there's a particular word that is interesting or group of words that is interesting. In verse 8, the psalmist would ascribe to the Lord the name, the Lord God of hosts. Or in your version, we'll say the Lord Almighty. This particular name of the Lord is a military term. It looks upon the Lord as the commander of the heavenly host and is high above any earthly military rank. And if you read, it's a very strange way to describe God considering the contents of the prayer. This prayer is not defeat my enemies on my behalf. It's a cry to be at the presence of the Lord. But the author seems to to believe that if we trust in the Lord, if I'm at the very presence of the Lord, then the Lord will fight my battles. Then the Lord will keep me. Then the Lord will strike down my enemies. So my worries are not my enemies. My worries are not the things I would want to achieve. My worry should be to pursue the Lord. He's similar like when David would approach this giant and with just a sling and a couple of stones, he trusts not that his sling is strong or the stones will do anything, but he says that you come, you come to me in, with swords and spear, but I come against you with the name of the living Lord. That we, our trust fundamentally should be on God and on God alone. Our desire should be being with the Lord and being with the Lord alone. And the Lord guarantees that all these other things as we've read in Matthew 6.33 will be sorted. But he says again, behold our shield, O God. That this God, similar in his uh, attacking of enemies, in his keeping the enemies at bay, he also defends from the very many things that the enemy might throw against you. That the Lord uh, will cover you with the many blows that may come. The terrors will be real throughout the year. The fears will be proper throughout the year. But the trust is the Lord will keep you. The Lord will shield you. The Lord will fight for you. And I ask you again, isn't this Lord worth seeking? Isn't this Lord worth devoting everything 
for? Isn't this Lord worth longing for with all that is within us? But if three points were not convincing enough, I added a fourth one. Uh, and this is the blessed assurance. If perhaps there is doubt that God can be fully trusted, then hopefully you'll get your assurance from this wonderful verses. Verse 10 would say, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts you. And this is the blessed assurance. The psalmist, as he continues in his delight for the very courts and the very presence of the Lord, considers that it's way better to be found at the feet of the Lord than any other place he would be. As I've mentioned before, this psalm is attributed to the sons of Korah. And if you have read the Bible or the first books of the Old Testament, you'd find a story in Numbers 16 about someone named Korah. Korah was uh, related to Moses and Aaron, and he leads a rebellion against Moses in relation to leadership. He, together with 250 people, would stand up and see that it's unfair that Moses and Aaron would set themselves up as leaders of the community. And as described in verse 10 of number 16, he wanted the priesthood for himself. And I say all this to show that years later, the Lord would cause the descendant of an individual who would spur up a rebellion against himself to write that I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That the descendants of someone who cared a lot about authority would pen down this word and say that I'd rather take the least of jobs in the temple if I'm with the Lord. Perhaps years later, the story of their ancestors' rebellion would be laying over their heads as many would recite the history of the community. But this shows that there is redemption to be found in God. That through the loins of one who would regard the leadership of the Lord would come a descendant that would care not for prosperity, would care not for fame, but rather the very presence of the Lord. That if he were to be found in the Lord, by the Lord, then that would be the most satisfactory thing. And this shows us that God redeems, God changes stories. And maybe you've come here today and this is your first time coming to church in a very long while. And you're sitting there and wondering, am I even worthy to be in the presence of the Lord? Maybe the guilt of your sin is hanging over you and you're questioning, is, is, am I enough for the Lord? The psalmist would tell us, better is one day in the courts of the Lord. Better is one day here today than wherever you would have been today. Better is today that you would come and listen to the words of this, uh, his great word and pray that the Lord may change you and he may rewrite your story. That he may rewrite your story and save you and deliver you. Just like me who's celebrating 10 years. Who would have wondered a sinner such as I would come and declare the very testimonies of the Lord. So the Lord can change your story. So better is one day. Better is one day than wherever you would have been today. But why is it better? Why should we regard the very presence of the Lord? Because verse 11 would tell us, for the Lord God is sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. In verse 12, he says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts you. The Lord is sun and shield. He gives light and guides, but also he gives cover. He grants honor and favor to those who trust in him. He gives good things. He blesses. The Lord blesses. Hebrews 11, verse 6, he says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. For they who draw near him must believe he exists 
And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Lord blesses, blesses. He keeps them not from his children. There's a salt I ran across last month. It's called Himalayan pink salt. I'm guessing some of you might have such salts. There's black salt, there's pink salt in your houses. And I have an interesting uh, habit of reading uh, information on like jars and cans. And when I was reading, the, the salt says it has benefits, a lot of benefits. This is what it has. It may help flush out toxins, it may help regulate blood sugar and hormonal imbalance. It may help improve digestion. It may help improve skin conditions and soothe sore muscles. I am not a nutritionist uh, by any regard. Neither do I have any information about the digestive system. But I know a bit of English. And when someone says may, there's a possibility it can. There's a possibility it cannot. And this salt is not assured. You won't sue them if blood toxins are not flushed out of your body. You won't sue them if your blood sugar is not sustained or if your digestion is not improved because they told you there is a chance it may, there is a chance it may not. But the psalmist, unlike this salt, is assured that this God keeps not good things, withholds not good things from those who walk uprightly. And I pray, I pray, I pray that that may be your outlook for this year. But as you reflect upon the very many things you're about to do this year, may the number one thing you desire to do, to be closer with the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to walk uprightly, to be holy as he is holy, to love him more, to love his people, to be found where his people are congregated. But then he concludes verse 12 and he says, O oh Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Happy is the one who trusts in you. And I pray that this blessedness is ours for this season. That we may be found joyful in the presence of the Lord. Joyfully trusting on him. Joyfully waiting for him. Regardless of what happens through this year. So in conclusion, what then is this dwelling place of the Lord that the psalmist yearned for? That we may seek it. And the, how then can we seek him and find our satisfaction in him? I believe that the dwelling place of the Lord is not a physical structure. It's more than this physical location that we gather every Sunday. The dwelling place of the Lord is in heaven, in eternity, where John in Revelation would say, this is Revelation 7, 15 to 17, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter, shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat on them nor any scorching heat. For the, lamb will be at the set, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And I call us brothers and sisters that our focus may be set on eternity. That our focus may be set on where the Lord is and we may be constantly asking ourselves, how can we reach there and how can we reach there well? So what do we do? What do we do? We read our word. I pray that as senior pastor has shared that you join us in reading the word together. You find a group of people who are studying the word together. May this year be that year that you finally finish that book of the Bible. May this be that year that though you've started years and years trying to go through the Bible, may this be that year. May this be that year that you finally join a Bible study group, a home group fellowship, that as you reflect at the end of the year, what you done, you can say, I read the word of the Lord more. May this be a year where you pray more, where you go on your knees for the good and for the bad, where you petition the Lord, where you cry out, oh Lord, take this burdens, or where you cry out, oh Lord, give me your peace. May this be that year where you pray more. May this be that year where you defeat your sins. But those things that have held you year after year, may this be that year where you finally receive freedom because you've decisively dealt with your sins. May this be that year where 
you finally, as I speak to the people at home, come to church. May this be that year where you leave your house and congregate with fellow believers physically. May this be that year. But finally, I make a call. Maybe you are here and you have no relationship with this great God. Maybe you're here and I'm wondering, okay, I've, I've never believed in him, so what do I do? And the Lord desires that you receive salvation. So I, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I cry out to you, be saved. Come and believe in this Jesus who left the pleasures of heaven and came down and lived as a man and died for the sake of our sins and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all authority, all rule, and draw closer to him. And I pray that this year, maybe that year that you get saved, that you experience true freedom and true joy, that you walk to eternity. And so as we conclude, I'd like to call us for a time of prayer. And maybe you're here and this particular word has challenged you to evaluate your prayer life, to evaluate your life, to evaluate your resolutions. I'd like to call us to, to stand. If you feel like you desire that this year be the year that your walk with the Lord changes, I call us to to stand as we pray together.